Good evening, everyone. I'm not going to be speaking tonight. I'm only going to hold you for about five minutes with a, a fairly shameless plug, okay? And um, so we got involved with the Carrie Gate 50 project, well, Carrie site, I should say, and the Carrie project about a year and a half ago. And this year is our 850th birthday. So there's a whole range of stakeholders from around the county and further afield coming together to celebrate that. And I'm sure a lot of people on the site know where the Carrick site is or know of the Carrick site, but I'm sure that there's some who don't. And I'd be confident that the ones who don't know what it is actually do. So that scene of the round tower that you can see on the horizon, that's actually built through the Carrick site, okay? And the tower is a full tower, so it's a fake. It's a very good fake, but it's only about 150 years old. But it's built through the very first Anglo-Norman castle in Ireland. So it was put up in the um, the autumn of 1169 by one of the first knights to land in Ireland, Robert de Stephen. And that obviously makes it 850 years as old, which is something we're incredibly excited about. So that's sort of the marketing pipeline we talk about the site. But there's also three or four of the reasons why it's important. It contains one of the earliest half dozen or so stone castles in Wexford, built by the Marshalls. And it's also one of the earliest Anglo Norman towns in Wexford, a town there that lasted about 150 years. And it would have had at one point up to about 110 houses. Okay, so that's a significant size settlement, about the third size of medieval Wexford at the time. So it's not an insignificant settlement that was found in Carrick, and um, certainly not a village. And it also had one of the earliest Anglo-Norman deer parks in Wexford. Okay, so the Anglo-Normans brought lots of things, among castles, military technology, and we'll be talking about all these things. And um, but they also brought some of their favourite deer species, prey species, including fallow deer. So they, they constructed these beautiful parks and um, to contain them so the lords could go in and hunt at their leisure. And Carrick would have had a two or three hundred acre um, deer park. So we got involved about a year and a half ago excavating this site. We were brought on board with Irish Heritage Park and joined a partnership with them to create the Carrick project. And what we do is we bring students from all over the world and they come and excavate the site. But as importantly, they open it to the public. So at any point during the summer or during the winter when we're there, we don't just you know, allow people to come, we actively welcome them. And there's tour guides on all day, every day to go and see the carry stuff, okay? So I'd encourage, I'm sure a lot of people here have been to the park and they're aware of the replicas and they're aware of the new Falconry Centre, but it's just another good reason to come and see the park itself, come up and talk to the archaeologists and see what they're doing. But the main reason I'm here tonight, and I've left leaflets on everyone's chair, which is just as well, the PowerPoint's not working, um, the main reason that I'm here tonight is just to let you know about the events we're having to celebrate our 850th birthday. And that starts tonight, and we're delighted that it starts with Emmett. So we have a series of four lectures throughout the summer, so they're every two weeks after tonight. And we've deliberately ensured that they're not all taking place in the park. So on a fortnight, we go to Ferns, and then we go to Tintern Abbey, and then we come back for our final um, talk here by Michael Totterton in July. And all those details are on the flyers on the sheet, okay? Then after that, because this is obviously an adult crowd, on the 26th of July we're having an open day on the site, which is more family focused and family orientated and we hope to attract some kids. And we will have all sorts of different people coming down with different demonstrations. So we'll have mounted combat, we'll have storytelling for children, we'll have an archaeology camp for kids. We'll also have lectures for the adults. UCD will be coming down to experimental archaeology workshops. The Discovery Programme are coming down to talk about replica artefacts. There really is something for everyone. That's on July 26th. But probably the thing we're most excited about or most proud of is the October conference. So we have an international conference in October, 18th and 19th. Um, and again, some of the details will be on that flyer, or if not, there's a link to our website and everything's up there. Um, and that's a two-day conference with 15 speakers on the first day and six practical workshops on the second. So the workshops are 90 minutes of hands-on activities learning about how medieval pottery was made or how we assess um, animal bones in archaeological collections. And the first day is more <coughs> sort of postcard snippet quick talks. So again, there's something for, for most audiences and, and for pretty much anybody who wants to go to it. On that conference, we're also going to launch our carry book. So if there's anybody interested in Wexford history, medieval history, Anglo-Norman, Ireland, it's a good mix of papers between the Carrick site itself, between Anglo-Norman medieval Wexford and between Anglo-Norman medieval Ireland. So I think that's probably enough of a plug, but we'd be delighted to see you all come at the events following us around the county. And I'll hand over to Emmett, um, and hopefully he'll have better luck with his PowerPoint than I've had with mine. Thanks very much, folks. Enjoy the talk. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis.
Yeah, right. So uh, the archaeology of medieval Wexford, the town and county, is what I want to speak about tonight. Can everybody at the back hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, if I speak too quickly or speak too quietly, somebody please put their hand up and uh, tell me to slow down a little bit. Uh, what do we want to talk about, what I want to talk about, because Dennis is finished now tonight, is really the, the life and um, experiences of people in 12th and 13th century Wexford, the county and the town. And rather than speaking about the history, I want to speak really about the archaeology, because archaeology is a study of material culture. It's a study of places and things, and as such, it's a really honest science. It doesn't really tell lies. The evidence of the past is, is partial. There's gaps there, but it's impartial. It doesn't come at us with any political slant. And that's slightly different to history. If we think about the history of the Anglo-Norman conquest of Ireland, uh, the original chroniclers are largely Anglo-Norman. Geraldus, Cambrensis, uh, beautiful French poems like the Song of Dermot and the Earl. They're really political uh, pieces of history. History belongs to the conqueror, let's face it. And then the historians that come afterwards who use that, um, they tend to read into um, the, the, the ideologies and the political viewpoints of those historical chroniclers. Whereas, if we look at the archaeology and interpret it with a fresh set of eyes, it actually shows um, a slightly more, um, shall we say, honest viewpoint of what was going on in Wexford both before and after the Anglo-Norman colony uh, conquest. So, what I want to do is I want to kind of chop up society into uh, the factors, the sites, the monuments which are scattered around the, the, uh, the county. And they are kind of urban settlement, rural settlement, trade, religion, um, and agriculture. And although they are not everything, in so much that education, health, uh, science, employment are not all of modern society, they do give us a good idea of what was going on, what the lived experience of people in Wexford was 850 years ago. So, rural settlement. Um, before the Anglo-Normans come, we have this very strong image that rural settlement in Wexford and in Ireland as a whole is um, a series of ring forts or raths, which are, as we all know, a very common feature in the Irish countryside. Does anybody from Ratnior recognise Grange ring fort? It's a really nicely surviving ring fort in the top end of the county. Um, there is a huge amount of ring forts in Ireland. There's about 45,000 of them known in, on the island of Ireland. In Wexford alone, we have 600 known ring forts. Um, they are typically circular, an earthen mound with a, a dike, moat or ditch outside it, maybe a palisade running around on top of the bank. And inside that, it's not the name ring fort is a little bit of a misnomer. They are they're defended farmsteads of the early medieval period. Interestingly, this course is the Irish National Heritage Park. I'm sure you all recognise it. It's not very often we get to see an intact ring fort. Most of them look like the one in Grange. So it's nice to go and have an idea of a palisade and thatched houses and agricultural activities going, in, going on in, inside them. But um, although we think of these as the very the typical pre-Anglo-Norman settlement in the Irish countryside, their construction is actually on the wane well before the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. Um, in fact, it looks like the construction of those 45 or 50,000 ring forts in Ireland really started to taper off in the 10th century, like a couple hundred years before the Anglo-Normans get here. Um, in Wexford, we don't really have a fully excavated ring fort. We do have one dated one from Temple de Croha near Adamstown. Um, a timber recovered from there was radiocarbon dated um, to the mid 8th century. So you're talking about being built in the 700s and that's a huge swell of time. You're almost talking the difference between Tudor Ireland and modern Ireland as you are talking about early medieval and Anglo-Norman Ireland. So the, the, the ring fort um, phase of Irish settlement starts, starts to diminish um, well before the Anglo-Normans get here. We don't really know why. And that's quite interesting. Why would Irish society choose to base themselves in ring forts defending their agricultural activity in the 8th, 9th and 10th century? And then by the 11th and 12th century, kind of have moved on. One reason might well be that society had become a little bit more peaceful or that regions and kingdoms had become larger. So if you look at powerful kings like Dermot McMurkida, who's the king of Wexford and the overlord of all of Leinster, if he's effectively controlling his territory, the people in his territory might not need to defend themselves nearly so much as they did a couple of centuries before when kingdoms were much smaller. Uh, so you've seen a, maybe a, a decrease, so to speak, in violent raids across territorial boundaries. Um, 
There's another reason uh, which has been suggested in recent years as well that ring forts seem to be very much a factor of pastoral agriculture. That you're looking at a lot of cows and cattle in the countryside being defended inside the ring forts because cattle are actually are movable wealth. You can come, you can rage, you can take away cattle. If you're moving towards more tillage, nobody can really come and take away your cornfields. So maybe you don't need to defend your farm in quite the same extent. One way or another, um, we can see from landscape analysis that cereal production is increasing in Ireland before the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. So that might be one of the reasons um, <clears throat> That might be one of the reasons that uh, apparently I have to update my virus protection. <laughs> apparently we can't trust Wexford Library. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I'm sure we can, my paranoid uh, laptop. Uh, now, the interesting thing about ring force, before I move on and discard them all together, is that uh, our landscape analysis here in Wexford shows that ring force and in Ireland as a whole are not a one size fits all monument. My bungalow is bigger than your bungalow and your three story farmhouse is bigger than my big bungalow. People live in different sized dwellings and they are responsive and uh, kind of indicative of their social status and wealth. Um, most ring forts are univillate. That means there's one bank with one ditch and that encloses a farmyard. Uh, more socially significant sites such as this one at Timona, which is near Kiltili, and another one at Ballinush near Bunclody, uh, were surrounded by two and even three banks of earth. So you get this multivalent, bi and trivalent uh, ring forts as we tend to call them. Now the interesting thing is they don't actually make for bigger ring forts. It's like when you've got a bigger car but you've still only got five seats inside it. Because in uh, Ballinush for example which has two or three banks around it, the inside diameter of the ring fort is still only 24 metres. Which is fairly typical farmyard size uh, enclosure even today. Um, but they're not more defensive either because you can't have loads of you know warriors or soldiers whoever out on the outer banks. This is about status. I have more rings than my ring fort and therefore I am more important. And the double and triple ring ditches might be occupied by local lords which are known at the time as Ara Fergal. So you're just talking about more elite members of society. Now, irrespective of social class, uh, lifestyles within ring forts uh, revolved around agricultural production. They're not military installations, they're just farms. Cattle rearing, was, cattle rearing was really important and where you've got cattle, you've got milk, where you've got milk, you've got butter, where you've got butter, you've got cheese and you start to see uh, an agricultural diet that would be quite familiar to us today. If you look at the picture, can you guys see this clearly? Yeah, It's actually good on the TV. Um, this is the ring fort at uh, Timona. You can see it's nice and circular. If I showed you a map from the mid 19th century, it's really defined. A modern farmer has broken out part of the ring for to, uh, he obviously wasn't worried about fairies, um, <laughs> to allow more cattle to wander into it. But you see this shadow here? I have a few photographs of shadows going on as we go through this. This is a crop mark. And it is the, the ditch, the moat of that ring fort, which silted up over a thousand years, became a little bit more moist. And in a nice dry summer, the grass grows greener in that ditch and you can see if you've got really good eyesight at the back Maura can you see it you, yeah. yeah you can two dark rings here showing that there are two ditches around this ring fort so you can see even flying over the landscape you can see the differences in the archaeological sites and you can see the wealth classes of people dispersed around the place that's really quite interesting um, as, so we're talking about cattle, we're talking about butter and all of those things but there's definitely tillage going on in uh, pre-Anglo-Norman 10th, 12th century Wexford, because at another ring fort at Raheen Agur and West near Gorey, um, recent investigations have shown cereal drying going on within the ring fort. So where you grow barley or wheat in Ireland, you need to store it, you need to knock the humidity out of it just like a modern farmer does, because if you store damp cereals over winter, they get all mouldy and you get ergot poisoning. And when you get ergot poisoning, you see really, really cool things and then you die, so it's not a really good thing to do. Um, now, after the arrival of the Anglo-Normans in 1169, ring forts were joined by other circular monuments in the countryside. I'm not quite sure why a medieval man was obsessed by circles, but we have loads of circular things going on. Uh, one of the things that hops up are moths. Uh, moths are defensive features, uh, like the Ringwork Castle that we'll have a chat about in Carrick in a couple of minutes, uh, and they often have baileys attached. These seem like really simple earthen mounds when you see them in the countryside today. But their appearance in late 12th century Wexford, and indeed Ireland, uh, was a real shock because these are fortified sites. These are not 
just farming places. These are things constructed by conquerors, by colonists, uh, by very aggressive social inclusions in your landscape. And it was a real indication of a changing political reality in 12th century Wexford. Um, it's not at all unique to Ireland. The Mott Castle is such a factor in Norman conquest that if you go to, bio, to the Bio Tapestry, uh, built to, um, I, I remember or celebrate, I suppose, the uh, Battle of Hastings and the uh, defeat of Will by William the Conqueror of, uh, of the English in 1066, there's a beautiful little picture of a mot being constructed by some English slaves and they're just shoveling the stuff up while some Norman soldiers stand around going, yep, keep shoveling, we need this to get higher, higher. So it's a real thing in Europe to build these mot castles. They're surrounded by a palisade, as you can see here, they're topped by a castle, which might be stone or wooden, and they're often put at important places in the countryside. And it's no coincidence that you'll often find them beside monasteries all throughout the island of Ireland. Here at the top end of ancient County Wexford, relatively recently stolen by County Carlow, uh, is St Mullins. And St Mullins, you can see the moth. Who slid that down to that on a plastic bag when they were a kid? Some of you are a little bit pre-plastic bags as kids but every child in my generation went up and down that thing on a plastic fertilizer sack and it was grey crack little did we know that we were wearing tracks in a, a protected archaeological monument but anyway you can see this is the monastery of Moling this is the river Barrow and here's the Mott and Bailey castle which has been constructed um, in the very early years of the Anglo-Norman conquest I like to go through the con countries playing spot the monument here's spot the Mott uh, this is Salvin, uh, Salvin outside Enniscorthy. I mean, it just looks like it needs a haircut. I kind of could do it with myself at the moment. Um, this is nine metres high, and it's on a precipice almost, on a high point, just at the back of Rolston Quarry, actually, overlooking the River Slaney. And you can imagine that with a wooden tower on it, with a palisade around it, a knight, archers, foot soldiers. This really controls the navigation of the River Slaney in the early years of the conquest. Um, and these often become broader settlements. They often become towns at Old Ross, not at all to be confused with New Ross. Uh, archaeological investigations there or around the Mott have shown that the site developed from a Mott and Bailey uh, to a fully developed medieval town complete with a stone castle. And that happened in the first couple of years of the Anglo, a couple of centuries, I should say, the 13th, 14th century of the Anglo-Norman conquest. So these are very much a first footprint. Am I moving too quickly? We all keeping up? Cool. But I started with ring forts, and if you remember, we're actually talking about rural settlement in medieval Ireland, or medieval Wexford, which is much more important than medieval Ireland. Um, the Mott and Bailey is not really the direct equivalent of the pre-Norman ring fort, because the Mott and Bailey is a castle. Um, the function of the defended farmstead was directly replaced by moated sites. And a moated site, despite the fact that it leaves aside the circle and moves into a square or a rectangle, is fairly much exactly the same thing as a ring fort. It tends to be situated in areas of good quality farmland. Uh, they have deep ditches and broad banks, uh, and on top of the banks you'll find a palisade. They tend to be square or rectangular, and inside them you'll find a farmyard with farming activity, animals, uh, kilns, all that kind of stuff. And although they are usually occupied in the 13th and 14th centuries by Ireland's new Anglo-Norman colonists, the Irish kind of get in on the trick as well, especially in the borderlands over west of the Shannon, you find uh, moths, or sorry, moated sites be constructed by Gaelic, um, Gaelic elites, so to speak, who are aping the architecture of the new conquerors, or maybe just saying, this is a good idea, we should build them for ourselves. This is Myler Park, uh, not from Myler's Park, I should say, not far from New Ross. And um, the uh, late Dr. Billy Colfer did an absolutely brilliant reconstruction of this, where you can see the trees are gone, uh, the grass is gone, and it starts to be a much more understandable space. A gatehouse, a nice big hall, a palisade, and outside, farming activity, mountains in the background. That's the, Billy Colfer's illustration from Oregon Trespass, if anybody has it, it's here in the library. It's a brilliant book. Now, the really interesting thing about the arrival of the Anglo-Normans is they really keep records, and they're fairly well obsessed with money. Um, so the uh, the construction of this particular moated site in 1283, 100 years after the arrival of the Anglo-Normans, is really well recorded in the bigot or bigot Earl of Norfolk um, manorial accounts. So we actually know who built it, 
when it was built, what it cost to build, and the uh, the carpenter, for example, who was working on the palisade, was being paid about four pennies a day, and he travelled out from New Ross, and his name was Stafford. Um, so it just goes to show you can't really get rid of a bad thing. Um, so luckily, I'm getting paid a little bit more than four pence. I hope same dimensions, almost to a blueprint, back to the same dimensions as um, were found at the site just outside Enniscorthy. Um, so this site, being in Carlow. Uh, we'll skip past it and we'll just go on to say that yeah well we're here to talk about Wexford we don't really want to talk about Carlo but that was a nice picture uh, right so we do know that various ring forts in County Wexford uh, continued in their occupation after the arrival of the Anglo-Normans we haven't yet excavated one Dennis's next project uh, excavating one which has been adapted into a moated site uh, but we know that at sites in Kinna and Harristown in the south of the county where it's all going on in the 13th and 14th century uh, that two ring forts were not abandoned and went on to be the sites of considerable domestic and agricultural activity in the 13th and 14th century so pottery recovered from the ring fort at Kinna which is this see the nice pottery Nice medieval pottery, see the ash on it from literally sitting in the fire. No agus. The fire is lit and you put your pot down in it and the pots actually get ash on them, which is really, really nice. And if you're really, really lucky, the food is still inside them as well. Um, not to eat now, to, to analyze, clearly. Um, so um, we can see from this rural site outside of Wexford Town, down in the south of the county, that the pottery here is both local and imported and is very similar to the pottery recovered from the streets of medieval Wexford. But there's a greater density of local pottery suggesting that maybe there isn't quite the same um, economic prowess going on on the site. But what's really interesting is the top two little things. This is how excited archaeologists get when I say really exciting and then I go, oh, look at this little thing here. Uh, that's a centimetre, by the way. These are two centimetres. Uh, that's furnace waste. So what we're actually seeing is that not only are these people farming and not only are they making pottery or buying pottery from France and from England, but they're, uh, they're making their own metal artifacts on site. So you've got a really involved local industrial process. What am I doing time wise? Um, so that's pretty much rural settlement. We could go on for an hour about rural settlement, but we want to talk about the rest of the things as well. So we'll move on and talk a little bit about urban settlement. This is Wexford Town. Um, Dennis seems very proud of the fact that he's got the first Anglo Norman fortification in Ireland out here. We are currently in the town library of Ireland's first Anglo Norman town. Um, and just like the ring forts and the moated sites and etc., the town of Wexford, which well predates the arrival of the Anglo Normans, sees a continuation and gradual development rather than a complete change after the arrival of the Anglo Normans. So in May 1169, as we all know, uh, Robert Fitzstephen landed with about 500 foreign soldiers. It doesn't seem like a lot, does it, to begin the conquest of a country? But anyway, 500 foreign soldiers at Banno Bay, the south coast of Wexford, uh, and soon after landing, Fitzstephen joins up the local forces of Dermot McMurkida, uh, the one-time king of Leinster, uh, the ancestral king of the Akinch League of County Wexford, and they're recorded as marching directly to the town of Wexford suggesting that both the Anglo-Norman Fitzstephen and the Irish Dermot McMurray sees this town as a place of economic and strategic significance. It's got a port. When you've got a port, you can land more soldiers. And furthermore, it's got trade, and where there's trade, you can make money. So this is a really important place to come. Uh, at the time, Wexford was a Hiberno Norse, kind of pseudo-Viking town, occupied by the descendants of the raiding Vikings. Um, and uh, they'd settled, of course, in Wexford and, and Waterford, Dublin, Limerick, etc. Uh, after they stopped raiding, once they started to settle in Ireland to trade. Um, the Anglo-Norman chronicler, I dissed them a little bit earlier. Gerald of Wales suggests that the town was defended at the time. Archaeologists agree with him. And the town was probably just South Main Street, really. About four to six hundred metres of a D-shaped enclosure right on the banks of the Slaney Estuary. This, would we be talking about kind of this little enclosure here? There's Rose Street. So coming along here into Ann Street. I think it's from Ann Street down around to the bottom of South Main Street. That's my guesstimation anyway of what the town is at the time. And the town was defended uh, by a defensive bank. Uh, it had a ditch, it had a palisade. We haven't yet found a stone wall. The Hibernian Norse did build stone walls in Waterford and in Dublin. We haven't found one in Wexford and I suspect it isn't there. It's a poorer place. It's not less culturally poor, it's just as less economic input to be going building walls. Um, but nonetheless, this palisade was substantial enough to withstand an initial assault by the Anglo-Normans. 
And then the next day, allegedly, according to uh, Gerald of Wales, there's a mediated surrender. So the town of Wexford actually surrenders to Dermot Murra and the Anglo-Norman Knights rather than being overwhelmed and perhaps slaughtered. But what's really interesting then, of course, is if you don't have to beat your way into a town, if you don't have to kill all the men who live in the town, if you don't have to burn down all the houses in the town, you have a population. So if you can turn that population into kind of serve into your service into if you can bring them under your cultural control you don't actually have to bring in a whole new series of colonists you have a town that you can control uh, there's no evidence that Fitzstephen displaced the existing residents of Wexford town in fact the archaeological evidence from South Main Street says the complete opposite the population or at least the architecture and lifestyles of this town were very similar in the decade before 1169 and the decade after 1169 what happens is it changes it starts to grow it starts to um new people come but the old people don't seem to go um, and the reason we know that is uh, no we'll stop there for a sec we'll say why we know in a minute um, but Fitzstephen has to be a little bit worried right he's a new lord in town he's been granted the town of Wexford with his brother Morris the Prendergast uh, sorry not Morris the Prendergast uh, Morris Fitzgerald uh, who incidentally brings the entire Geraldine line into Ireland and so Silk and Thomas, the Geraldine Rebellion, all of that stuff starts with the first Anglo-Norman Lord of Wexford. But that's a whole other story. Fitzstephen is a little bit antsy. You know, there's a lot of these Vikings around with their axes and they say they're going to pay him taxes, but he doesn't have a whole lot of soldiers. So our chroniclers again record that in 1170, within months of arriving in Wexford town, he builds himself a fortress on a steep crag about two miles from Wexford. It's called Carrick or the rock in the vernacular. And Fitzstephen's castle at Carrick is now, or was then, the earliest named and dated Anglo-Norman fortification on the island of Ireland. And it is currently under investigation by the Irish Archaeological Field School. Plug enough for you, Dennis? Great. Yes, yeah. uh, you're welcome. Uh, so this ringwork castle, which we're looking at here, imagine this with a palisade. Imagine this with the ditch cleaned out rather than being left for 800 years or so to uh, acquire dirt. <coughs> Excuse me. And imagine it with just half a dozen archers inside, with a few hundred arrows each, on that crag over the Slaney. Imagine the damage they could do to anybody transiting up and down the Slaney. And it's not the only one. If you go to Dun and Orr, uh, just outside Enniscorthy, and Enniscorthy itself, where there was another ringwork castle under what is now the Stone Castle, you can see that the Anglo Normans come in and they build these ringwork castles at transit points, at places that they can control movement. And where you control movement, you control military prowess, and you control money. So these become a network of fortifications on the River Slaney. But we're supposed to be talking about urban settlement, so I'm going to leave Dunanore behind. Um, if you're in Wexford in 1169, I'm saying you're lucky enough not to get your head chopped off on the first day, you get to stay. Uh, you've got a new lord, you've got new taxes, etc. Um, and life does change, but it's not immediate. The existing town fences evolved from a simple earthen bank and ditch to a more effective stone wall. And substantial elements survive. I apologise once for not having any medieval gates at a conference in, in Wexford. I said, oh, you know, we don't have any medieval gates. And somebody from Castle Dermot came up and said, never apologise. We don't even have a wall. <laughs> um, so uh, this is the wall of Wexford. This is recently uncovered, actually. Uh, this is the foundation. It's actually not the foundation. It would once have been up in the air, but it's now buried. Uh, it's just beside Peter's Square, down that way. Uh, and it's 1.4 metres wide at the base. And it's mortared with a locally quarried stone, mortared with lime. And it's a really substantial wall. What's important to note here, especially for the aspiring archaeologists here, uh, this is what we call in the profession GAC. So uh, when you dig down in this part of the town, you find loads of gack and you get the gack out of the way and you get lovely archaeological preservation. Wexford Town's a really wet town. Archaeologists hate digging in the wet, but love taking the artifacts out of the wet because wet preserves things. And we'll have a look at a couple of those later. Uh, now, Wexford Town was extended, of course. We're in the extended town wall. Uh, you can see it here. It's up to six metres high. That's a really substantial wall. Um, it has a wall walk, it has crenellations, and it really controls transit in and out of the town. Uh, probably by the end of the 13th century, by the end of the 1200s, if not earlier, the town wall as we know it today was complete. And Wexford Town really hasn't changed in the thoroughfares and street patterns since. The street patterns that we walk on 
are the street patterns that our 800 year old ancestors walked on. It's really amazing. Um, this is Selskir Gate, otherwise known as Westgate. It's not Westgate, it's Selskir Gate. Stop calling it Westgate, people are expert. Uh, Westgate has been demolished. It hasn't existed for 200 years. There's this brilliant story where the five medieval gates of Wexford, we haven't really investigated any of them, but we know where they are. They're knocked down in the late 18th century because the corporation wants to um, increase traffic. You know, traffic equals trade equals money. It's like putting in a bypass. Uh, so they knock down the gates and then 1798 happens and the rebels just walk into town and it doesn't work out very well at all. Uh, so immediately after 1798, the corporation build back up the gates with kind of breeze blocks and plywood. You know, they're kind of a shoddy job. And then nobody ever raids the town again, so they knock them down again about 20 years later. So, you know, keep your medieval gates, they're important. Uh, this is actually, a, although this is what our medieval gates would have looked like, including the one here in John's Gate Street. This is a private gate um, for uh, the Augustinian Priory of Saints Peter and Paul. Uh, saint Selskers, uh, saint Selsker only exists in Wexford Town. Selsker is the address, there is no saint, but it's actually an Augustinian Priory, as I'm sure most of you know. Uh, but it's nice to call it saint Selskers because we know what we're talking about. Um, anyway, what was going on inside the walls? Why am I saying that nothing changes for a while anyway? Gerald of Wales, this fantastic chronicler, if you don't mind a little bit of politically biased history, um, tells us that there are suburbs outside the town and they're burnt before the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. Us archaeologists haven't found those yet. If anybody finds kind of burnt layer down digging spuds in the fight, please call me. Uh, I'd like to find it and get my name on it. Uh, we, can, we can share credit. Um, anyway, this is what the town looks like. Um, he, he's telling us that there, is a t the, there are suburbs there, but we haven't found them. But inside the town walls, pre anglo Norman settlement, has been uncovered at two South Main Street sites. That seems to be the core of the Hibernian Norse town. Interestingly, the continuity of settlement, which I suggested by saying that the people weren't all slaughtered and all kicked out, is uh, supported by the archaeological evidence, which suggests or indicates, in fact, proves that the house types constructed the materials and architecture building houses in Wexford before 1169 and after 1169 are pretty much exactly the same. So you've got people going out in the landscape to get the same timber, the same straw, and using the same architectural technology as they were before the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. In other words, it's the same builders. So you've got the same people staying here. Uh, this is a lovely house excavated in 1988 at the junction of South Main Street and Bride Street by Ed Burke, uh, who was then the, um, the Borough Council archaeologist, actually the only person ever to hold that title. Um, and Ed revealed uh, that this 11th century house was on a plot uh, which extend, continued in use the actual plot of land into the 14th century and was perpendicular to Main Street. So it was laid out at the same time as the street was. Uh, he also revealed that the house types being constructed there uh, were exactly the same as those being built in 12th century Dublin. So they're what we call a Dublin type house. Um, can we see this? This is a really nice illustration done by an archaeologist called Simon Dick. I've only one problem with it. This good lady who's hanging her washing up on the purlin uh, has neglected to put a roof on her house. So it's not going to work very well. Uh, but this is actually what this looks like when archaeologists find it. So when we say, I found a medieval house! And people come and look at it, they're going, what's this mess, you know? Um, but you can see a row of stakes down at the far end of the photograph at right angles coming down this way. And then down in the mud, the gack, down in the gack, uh, in the middle of the house, you can see posts which held up the roof and also uh, wattle, um, which would once have been wall material or roofing material. So you get the hole, you get the material, you get the diet, you get the seeds, you get the things you don't really want to think about very much. Uh, you get everything to do with medieval life inside these houses. You get a real good idea of what these people were, uh, were living with. Here's a slightly more recent excavation from the back of the Thomas More Tavern. Uh, so this is the corn market. This is a later house. This is a 14th or 13th century house. This is after the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. It's exactly the same house. Um, you can see oysters being eaten. Uh, oysters were not an upper class food in the medieval period. That's why we have Oyster Lane. Oysters, you buy them by the bucket um, and the, you just feed them to all and sundry. Uh, you can see the posts here, which held the house up. This is the wall. Um, and you can see here where the red and white ranging was, bits of barrels, so you get indications of trading material. So basically this house is about 5.4 metres wide and at least 6 metres long. I say at least because the back end of it was gone. So it was at least 16, 18, 20 feet long. 
um, is a really simple internal layout. You've got an aisle down the middle, you get divided kind of sleeping benches and storage areas on either side, and then a nice hearth in the middle. Uh, it's really architecturally simplistic, um, and you kind of you start to think that's very primitive until you get into it and you start to get the artifacts out of it. Uh, this particular house had some really nice leather shoes, it had fragments of chain mail, um, and like the developed sites that, of the developed rural sites like Kinna and Harristown, it had a lot of locally produced pottery. But it also had evidence of international contact in the form of pottery imported from England, from France, and from the Low Countries, from the Netherlands. So you get to see the trading network that these Anglo-Normans bring to Wexford and the international contact uh, that the changes in society bring about. Anyway, this, for example, is the kind of hearth you'll find in the middle of those houses. Uh, again, no aga, nice big open fire, put your pot down in it, cook up your porridge, big into porridge, the medieval people, uh, largely because they didn't have ovens. Uh, but anyways, we've got these post model houses, very much like the ones you see out in the Heritage Park, if you go out today, the ones especially out in the little, the Viking settlement beside the river, uh, is, that is Wexford Town. South Main Street in particular in the 10th, 11th, early 12th century is a one-sided street. The street is washed by the sea on the water side. So you've got houses, long houses pointing with their gable-ended doors out towards the sea. And when the mist is out in the Heritage Park on a kind of a, a winter's midday or a summer's morning and the mist comes in through the reeds, you get this beautiful picture of what medieval, medieval Wexford really, really looked like. Um, but these weren't the only houses being built. They do, are the only houses we as archaeologists have found in Wexford Town in the 13th century. But within 100 years or so, by the 14th century, we're starting to see substantial reclamation and big stone houses. And there was one big stone house from North Main Street, um, just the other side of the Bullering really, uncovered about 20 years ago uh, that dates to the 14th century. So you're starting to see bigger stone houses being built eventually, but not immediately after the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. Uh, so if the continuity of construction techniques and property boundaries in the late 12th century indicates the survival of a settled population, so does religion. The parishes of Iberius, Mary, Patrick and Dulog, they're all hibernal Norse dedications. If you have a completely removed population, if you slaughter everybody in the town, you just build your own new churches, you rename your parishes, you don't go around talking about Olaf and Ibar as the saints. Mm. So you're really seeing this continuity uh, in, in all se senses. Um, clearly things are changing, but people are still in place. And there's a really nice medieval document dating to 1283, um, which indicates this. So 1283, 100 years after the arrival of the Anglo-Normans, um, there is a document which says that in the early 13th century, in the time of the Marshals, the William Marshals, there were within the county of Wexford, five score foreign Ustmen, 100 foreign Easterners. Easterners are the Norse, because they come from the east of here. They were very rich and they had many beasts. But these are the guys who the Anglo-Normans conquer. And they're still re very rich with many beasts. So they're conquered, but they're not, they're not displaced. They just start to owe their allegiance to somebody else. But there is a changing political, cultural reality happening throughout the 13th century. Because by 1283, this hiberno Norse population is described as not more than 40 Ustmen, and they only have a little property, finishing in wealth throughout the 13th century. But throughout the late 12th century, they're doing hunky-dory. Oh, look at that. You got any of that? Yeah, we have a few pieces here. My stuff's better. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> McMurray and Fitzstephen assault to Wexford in 1169. Because, as I said, they want to control a place of strategic value and which has an international trading port. It already has an economic value. That Hiberna Norse town of Wexford is part of a really extensive late Viking age trading network. The people of Wexford, or at least the culture to which they belong, are trading west to Iceland, to Greenland, even to North America, and eastward to continental Europe, to Istanbul, and even the Far East. Uh, Gerald of Wales records that when Fitzstephen and his men attacked Wexford, they burned any ships they found in the harbour. And that is such a cultural assault to burn your ships. You know, it's, if, you, if you're living by the sea, to have somebody burn your ships is a terrible thing. Um, but the international contact uh, of, of these Wexford tradesmen is specifically mentioned at that time in the 12th century source because one of the ships is recorded as having come from Britain to trade and was laden with wheat and with wine. So you can even see what's coming in before the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. And the very few pieces, because the Hiberna Norse were largely aceramic, they didn't <coughs> use a lot of pottery, for reasons known only to themselves. Uh, the very few pieces of internationally traded pottery that we find in uh, Wexford before the Anglo-Normans arrive are actually German 
We're getting pottery being made in Germany, a place called Pafrath, being moved across the North Sea, maybe even across England or around England, across the Irish Sea, and into Wexford. So you're getting international trade there. Um, but if it wasn't a new concept, international trade increases whole scale after the arrival of the Anglo Normans. Economic profiteering is really what they're about. And we can tell from the excavations which are undertaken after the arrival of the Anglo Normans how internationally connected and how economically uh, active the people of Wexford were by looking at the pottery. And we can see that between 30 and 40% of the pottery is actually imported. This is all English stuff. It's got lovely handles, lovely ergonomic handles. This is tableware. So that black stuff I showed you earlier with the soot on it, if you have a, a, a cultural or economic ambition to look good to your neighbours, you don't put that on the table. You get this nice imported stuff, you put it up there. And uh, we get a lot of stuff coming from Flanders. Uh, we get a lot of French pottery imported from the Bordeaux region because Bordeaux then is now has quite nice wine. So if you're going to have some French wine, you should have some French, French tableware to put it in and then you've really got an economic status going on. There's stuff from Utrecht coming into Wexford all in the 13th, 14th century of thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of pottery, enough to do these kind of uh, uh, modelling schemes where you can see where the stuff is coming from. Um, so, uh, you know, does Wexford change? It gets a bit bigger. The houses eventually evolve. The, the foreigners, be the Oostmen, the, the hybrid Norse become less important. The trading increases. The wine consumption goes up a little bit. Um, you know, it, it, it's not that different. But what's really different after the Anglo-Normans come is how many towns there are. In 1169, we've got Dublin, we've got Wexford, we've got Water, we've got Cork, and we've got Limerick. They're the main towns in Ireland. That many. Uh, by the early 14th century, County Wexford alone has more recorded urban towns than all of pre-Norman Wexford. That's really interesting. Um, you kind of get Irish settlement sites like Ferns uh, coming up from their proto-urban roots and becoming incorporated towns. Uh, you get uh, the town of Enniscorthy coming out of an ecclesiastical settlement. Uh, you get the brand new town of Carrig, which Dennis mentioned earlier. And then you've got Anglo-Norman foundations like um, Old Ross, Tumon, Clumbines, Banno, this is Banno, Great Island, uh, and of course the great port town of New Ross. Before we get on to New Ross, this is St. Mary's Church in Banno. You all know where it is? Those of us who are local? Uh, right there. See all the rings around it? Last summer, the ground got so dry, every farmer in the country said, oh, I have no pasture, nothing's going to grow. What are my cows going to eat? And all the archaeologists in the country went, whoa! Um, because all, all of those damp, uh, waterlogged archaeological spots that have been in fields for 800 years, that was the only place the grass grew. So you get to see from the more verdant, in, or even here in Tillage, it's not just grass, you can see all these lines. And what you've got here is, I'm hooked up, no, I'm not hooked up. See that? That's a street running up behind the church. You can see house plans. We could talk about this for an hour. I can even see a house, an individual structure there. Uh, there's a key here going into what they call the little sea locally down there in Banno. The whole thing just sprang out of the ground. This town survived into the 16th century, but thrived in the 13th century, 13th, 14th century. And then it started to, like a lot of these places, go for various reasons. The port silted up, uh, they all got the plague, uh, all kinds of nasty things happened. <laughs> you don't want the plague, right? The plague is bad. Uh, now, I said the great port of New Ross. New Ross is a custom built, greenfield planned town built in the early 13th century uh, by William Marshall and his wife Isabel de Clare, granddaughter of Dermot McMurkada. Uh, this is the biggest town in Ireland, New Ross. Who's from New Ross? <laughs> There's only one person still living in New Ross, look, and she's here tonight. Uh, New Ross is genuinely the largest single wall town in Ireland. There's 39 hectares inside the phenomenal surviving stretches of the medieval town of New Ross. There's 25 hectares inside Wexford's walls. Where does that put us? I always get insulted when I think about that. The archaeology is better here though. Um, now, a medieval French poem dating to 1265 uh, records the walling of the town by the people because they were a bit worried about the neighbours. Um, it's a brilliant poem. It, it goes on to say there's contract difficulties, they fire the labourers, the women build one gate, the vintners build another gate on a Monday for some reason. Who, you know, why would the wine sellers want to be working on a Monday? Um, but it is very genuine. It's the biggest walled town in Ireland. Now, it's not as big as Wall Dublin, but Wall Dublin is built in various different phases. This is built in one go. It's got 100 acres inside it. Uh, portions of, it, uh, of the wall still survive. The Maiden Gate is still there. The only medieval gate surviving in Wexford is the Maiden Gate, the one built by the women. 
No, I don't want to be sexist, but what does that say about the quality of construction? Um, this is it. The, what's really interesting is that archaeological uh, interpretations, I, I actually, no, I haven't published it. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, there is a, this is where we find all the archaeology in, in Euros. This area here, whenever we dig holes in it, we find absolutely nothing. Um, so it's built by William Marshall. He's the Earl of Pembroke, of course. He's the wealthiest man in Ireland, basically. It's his inland port town. It's all about trading up to Kilkenny City, basically. Um, but th it, seems to, um, it seems to have not fulfilled its early promise. It's built at 1265. Uh, it's, it's growing so fast. They go, no, we have to build a really big town. And then all kinds of things go wrong socially and the town starts to collapse and never really fills it up. Um, it does have an exceptionally large medieval parish church. It's five parishes in medieval Wexford town, one in Wexford, or one in New Ross. New Ross is twice as big as Wexford town. And there's still only one parish. It's because the town is built in one, one parish, St. Mary's Parish Church. And you really should go if you have never been around St. Mary's Parish Church. Uh, which is still 800 years later a continuing place of Christian worship. That's really interesting. Uh, you should go and have a look. It has beautiful architecture. This is a tomb niche in the chancel right beside the altar. This is the most important place in a medieval church. And um, it has nicer architecture, frankly, than anywhere else in Wexford town, uh, including Selskers. So it's a really smashing piece of architecture. This is an, archite uh, an architectural reconstruction, so to speak, of what a medieval church looked like. Riots of colour incense, smoke, Latin being chanted, people being buried, all kinds of exciting stuff. Um, this is called the Bambino of New Ross and it's a really sad little thing but it's a beautiful piece of architecture. It's actually a swaddled baby flanked by a mother and father's faces and you can really see that medieval grief uh, in this architecture. Um, uh, so anyway, like I was saying, it's a big port town. It is actually the most prolifically trading port town in Ireland. In 1275, more taxes are paid in New Ross than any other port in the country. Little old New Ross, biggest port, biggest town in Ireland. Um, things go a little bit wrong with New Ross. Uh, it diminishes in status, uh, largely because of the nasty people from Waterford kind of cripple it uh, culturally and, and tax-wise. But in 1349, after the arrival of the Black Death, the plague, the plague really affects these Anglo-Normans because they're living in towns. A lot of the wild and woolly Irish are still living in very secluded habitations. They don't transmit diseases nearly as much. The plague hammers places like Banno, Great Island, uh, these Anglo-Norman towns. And there's a chronicler who says that the community in New Ross in 1349 are in such an unaccustomed state of misery, poverty and helplessness that a great part of the men are ready to leave and fly to foreign ports. Reminds me of 2009. But anyways, um, so all of the new and expanded towns, uh, we, religion, right? Uh, Religion is incredibly important in medieval Europe. There's such an incredibly literal belief in of the totality almost of the Christian church, of course, um, that wherever people go, they build churches and they worship in churches and they invest wealth into churches. So you can really see the scale of a settlement if you go and have a look at its parish church, hence the importance of Euros and the largest parish church in all of medieval Ireland, as far as we know. Uh, so all of these new and expanded towns and settlements, they come complete with their own churches and parishes. Uh, they're often dedicated to really favoured Anglo-Norman saints like Anne, Catherine, James, Nicholas. These are the saints that really get the Anglo-Normans excited as opposed to Ibar and Olaf here in Wexford. Um, many of the church sites are still visible long after the settlements they once served have been lost to war, famine and economic collapse. And at Banno, for example, the site of the first Anglo-Norman landing in 1169, the parish church, which is dedicated to St. Mary, uh, was built by the year 1200. We know that for an historical fact and the architecture supports it anyway. The church as it stands today is very kind of 14th century, maybe even as late as 15th, but probably 14th. It's got these nice crenellations on top, makes it look a bit castle-like and makes you feel, you know, that your nice chalices are well protected. It also says we are an important community. We can afford to do this. Uh, this church is still standing and still in occasional use. There's mass here every year. Uh, there's people being buried in there too largely until today, literally. Um, it's still standing long after the town that it once served was reduced to those crop marks we looked at a few minutes ago. It's just the, 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 the longevity of the quality masonry from the medieval period is quite amazing. Uh, right, I'm going to hurry up a little bit because I'm, I'm, I'm diverging. Is anybody getting tired? Do we need to take a break? Yeah, go down to Sam's more, quick half one and come back up. No, we all right? 
Um, right, uh, that's a good plug for Thomas More. They owe me a few drink later. Uh, anyway, archaeological evidence uh, for the, from the 13th century uh, shows that as well as these new towns and new churches uh, being built in the new Anglo-Norman settlements, pre-existing ecclesiastical sites in Wexford are being developed. So again, the religious worship isn't changing. The settled communities of County Wexford are still going to their old churches. And we can see at places like St. Duan's down at Hookhead, and here in May Glass, just a little to the south of us, Hiberno Romanesque architecture, which predates the arrival of the Anglo Normans. So we're seeing this doorway standing here in 1169 when Robert Stephen splashes ashore. So if the doorway is still there and the church is still there, although it's enlarged in the medieval period, Again, we can see it's probably the, the same pastor is, or same priest is ministering to the people. The same community is worshipping in there. New people come, new architecture happens, but it's not a complete shift. And that's really quite interesting. I said that about how many times have I said interesting? I should stop that, right? Now, aerial photography. Did I mention how much we like aerial photography in the archaeological profession? Uh, aerial photography shows us that uh, other church sites like this one at Bollebeg and Temple Shambo. There's another one uh, at Calegny near Clonroach. They are centered, these medieval church sites, Anglo-Norman church sites if you want, I prefer to say medieval, but anyways. Uh, they're centered on large ecclesiastical enclosures which long predate the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. So again, see the, the enclosure line here? The bivalent and probably trivalent actually, ecclesiastical enclosure here, about 100 meters in diameter. Nobody built like that in the 13th or 14th century. anglo Normans don't build like that, and yet they build a medieval church in the middle of it, which just goes to show, again, they're just coming in to the landscape and they're adapting what's there, not sweeping everything aside. Um, oh, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, and that's going on with monasteries as well. So this is a parish church, which probably was an early medieval monastic site. But we do know we go down to Tintern and we go down to Dunbrody and we see what the Cistercians are building in Anglo Norman Wexford and the power and the wealth of those monastic orders. And we kind of think that they came with the Anglo Normans, but really religious practices were very much in evolution throughout the 12th century in Ireland, um, both before and after the arrival of the Anglo Normans. And for example, in Ferns um, uh, and places like um, Mellifont, for example, in the middle of the country, uh, Balton Glass in Wicklow. Uh, local leaders, uh, saints like Malachi of Armagh, kings like Dermot McMurrah, are bringing continental orders, modern church and um, monastic practices to Ireland, and they're doing it for the dedication and betterment of their own souls, of course. They're establishing these churches. The reason we find Cistercian abbeys in places like Tintern and Augustinian abbeys in Selskar and here in Ferns is that Augustinians are mendicant. They're, they take vows of poverty. Cistercians don't. Cistercians love money. You want about 15,000 acres to run a good Cistercian abbey. Um, you get by with a few dozen acres around your Augustinian priory and they take alms and feed poor people and etc. So you'll always get Augustinian abbeys beside towns and Cistercians out in the countryside. Um, now what's really nice here of course is you can see here's your 12th century Irish, if you like, Abbey, and behind it, you've got your 13th century Anglo-Norman Cathedral. Uh, the, the original medieval cathedral farm seems to have been built by a guy called John St. John or John St. John, whose funeral effigy is allegedly in the existing cathedral in Ferns today. It's not necessarily him, but it's a really good story, so why not? It probably is him anyway. Um, but they're building beside the modern, or the modern, the Anglo-Norman, Cathedral is being built beside the pre-existing Irish Augustinian Abbey. So again, even within religion, people aren't being displaced. Orders aren't being displaced. In fact, the Bishop of Ferns seems to have stayed there before and after 1169. So you get a big continuity, uh, but also brand new building like in Tintern and in uh, Dunbrody. So what does that leave us with in our list of things that happened in medieval Ireland? Agriculture, and it's not just medieval Ireland, Ireland is an agricultural nation. We super produce food now, and we super produce food in the 13th century. It wasn't until the 1960s that census returns show more people in Ireland living in towns than in the country. So within just half a century from now, we were a completely rural population, not completely, but predominantly rural population. Um, and economic profiteering is very much the point of the Anglo-Norman conquest. They're not here to make us better. They're not here to teach us more stuff. They're not here to make us bow down to them. They're here to make money. And money is farming in the 13th century. In the 12th and 13th century, the population of Europe is growing. 
it was urbanizing and it needed to be fed and needed to be clothed from the farmland uh, which was being developed by a growing system of feudal lordship and international trade. Uh, tillage was a very important part of Irish life before and after the arrival of the Anglo-Normans. Wheat and barley have been grown in Ireland since the prehistoric period. 6,000 years ago, people were eating wheat and barley cakes. Um, oats seem to have become the dominant cereal crop of early medieval Ireland before the arrival of the Anglo-Normans, probably because our climate had gotten a bit wetter. Climate change is not new, it's just faster this time around. Um, so wetter early medieval Ireland means that oats grew better and people ate oat cakes and loads and loads of porridge. As I said earlier, um, excavations at Rahina Gurn West, well, I didn't say that earlier, uh, outside Gori have shown the evidence of early cereal drying kilns um, and which were built between the 9th and maybe the 13th century. At this site, anybody know where this is? Oh yeah, Great Island. Yeah. <laughs> I, should put the, I should put the name up on a delay just for fun, see who's awake. This is Great Island. Uh, this is adjacent to Harvey de Montmorency's medieval town of Great Island. But this is one of the largest monastic enclosures in the country. It's about 300 meters top to bottom and about 230 or something left to right as far as I can remember. Uh, in the middle of this there's a little pond and if you go to Kilmakee House and Gardens today you'll see the pond. I think there's a little dinghy on it. That's actually a mill pond and uh, the mill which was discovered there in the 20th century has been dated. Uh, there was grinding stone and there was what we call um, you know, a sluice or a flume, the thing that shot the water down into the, uh, into the, the grinding wheel, the power wheel which turned the grinding wheel. Because of the magic of tree ring dating, we can look into that oak and timber and see how old it was. And uh, it was being, it was, uh, that mill was constructed in the 9th into the 10th century. So again, a couple of hundred years before the Anglo-Normans come, Big ecclesi enough, ecclesi enough ecclesiastical tillage activity going on here to need a mill, not just a grinding stone. So you're getting a sense of the countryside being developed um, long before the arrival of the Anglo Normans. But there is an increased sense of an increased uh, kind of agricultural production in the 13th century, an increased agricultural trade of agricultural activity. Um, in the early years of the Anglo Norman colony, people in Wexford would have looked out the sea and seen boats very, very similar to the Viking Nars, the trading ships, not the long ships, uh, of the earlier settlers. Uh, they had clinker built hulls, they had single masts, they had square sails, they had steering oars rather than tillers and rudders. And if you look at this St. Selskers funeral effigy, uh, this is just under the tower in Selskers if you wander up there. It's really hard to see now but it was published in the 19th century, luckily, you could see that this person, who has a really funky 13th century haircut, I love that haircut, that's really common. They're everywhere when you look at these 13th century effigies. Lovely curly hair. I don't have curly hair, so I can't get one of these. Uh, I'm envious. You can see the ship, which looks very Viking, but it's actually an early Anglo-Norman trading ship. And then the other thing that we see, we haven't found a boat yet. You know those boats that were burnt by the Anglo-Norms in 1169? There's a suggestion that one of those might be under kind of the Dunmira Theatre or something like that. Um, that would be very exciting. Uh, but what we do find is nails. Now nails are fairly, you know, commonplace and pretty boring and every time you plough a field they turn up. But these are clench nails and they're actually used to, sh to uh, hold ship's timbers together. So what you're looking at there is the fleeting evidence of a Viking ship from South Main Street from 850 or 900 years ago. And we know that because these nails are found wherever we find Viking shipbuilding, Viking ship burning, etc. So you can see what kind of ships are coming in, even if we don't actually have the vessels themselves. Um, but as the quantities of agricult agriculture produce exported from Ireland increased, so did the scale and the draft of the Viking ships. And just like the commercial port of Wexford Town being closed in the 1960s, because the boats had got too big and the harbour got too silty, harbours start to become very important and in Wexford town that's why we have a seaward side of South Main Street because we see in New Ross and Wexford town reclamation happening you get timbers driven into the ground get rubbish and stones and bones and dead dogs and all that kind of stuff thrown into the uh, into the sea and that builds up a nice key front and then you can get a bigger boat in and this is the kind of vessel that would have been coming into 14th century Wexford and New Ross in the 15th century um, a place called Newport in Wales, a vessel ran ashore uh, and, and, and was scrapped and lost in the mud and it was excavated a few years ago, it was about 85 feet long. So a good sized 15th century trading vessel was about the same size as, remember the Asgard, the Irish shell training vessel? It's 
about the same size as that. Not small at all. Uh, so you need quite big ports to come into. This lovely little inscription here, which we've copied and turned into that, you can see how archaeology is inscribed in plaster in St. Mary's in New Ross, and we turned it into this drawing for an interpretive panel. It's completely accurate. Um, <laughs> right, uh, yeah, so what we do, uh, anyway, we've seen these towns get the ports getting, the water getting deeper, the, uh, the keys getting bigger, um, but it's not completely new. Uh, we know that before the arrival of Anglo Normans, Dermot McMurkita is exporting material off the island. It's probably where he has the wealth to go and start kind of talking to international um, mercenaries, in essence, the Anglo Normans. And at Gerald of Wales, who's not that great a, a cultural chronicler when it comes to the native Irish. He tends to say quite nasty things. But he does remark that Ireland is pleased to send the hides of animals and the skins of flocks and wild beasts overseas. But then he kind of goes into his early cultural stereotyping, which he does a lot about the Irish. And he notes that much of the returning cargo coming into towns like Wexford in the 12th century uh, is made up of vast quantities of wine. So much so that one would scarcely notice that grapes were not cultivated in Ireland. <laughs> Look at a false Ireland uh, advertising slogan for, for Ireland today, you know. What do the sons of visiting presidents do as soon as they come to Ireland? We just can't shake this drinking culture image. Anyway, there you go. Uh, 12th century Ireland was a place capable of producing agricultural excess, obviously. But one significant change is not that tillage is introduced, but that tillage becomes more predominant. I said that had already been happening maybe from the 10th century and that's possibly why Ringfort starts to be not so much abandoned as not built anymore. But we do know from uh, domain records and landscape analysis studies that as much as 70 to 75% of the main land was under tillage in the 13th and 14th centuries. Uh, and that's a lot of land. There's nowhere near 70 or 75% of Ireland under tillage today, of farmland in Ireland. So you can see tillage becoming really important. Uh, mills like the ones in, uh, in um, Great Island become ever more important. More mills are built. Mills like salt mills down in, Dun or in Tintern in, are not milling salt. They're milling using salt water. So they're water-powered mills, which are known as salt mills. Windmills start to appear because water doesn't flow everywhere in Ireland, and windmills do tend to appear with the Anglo-Normans. Um, so we, uh, archaeological excavations at Camross, uh, for example, have revealed probably kiln associated with the drying of crops during the later medieval period. Uh, there were charred remnants of oat and wheat grains. So again, you see oats being significant, but wheat coming back into predominance as well. Uh, and the site was associated with the moated site that we were talking about earlier. So you see agriculture remaining the same, but changing, as agriculture always does. And interestingly, on that rural site in Camross, there was a lot of imported pottery, just like there is in Wexford Town. Of course, Camross is pretty close to Wexford in the grand scheme of things. But they had Redcliffe pottery, uh, they had uh, Leinster cooking ware, they locally produced pottery, English pottery. Uh, so you've got a really similar lifestyle going on at that point between the rural dwellers close to Wexford Town and the people in Wexford Town itself. Um, so what was changing with medieval Wexford? So I've said, you know, the architecture is the same. The town gets a bit bigger. The wine consumption goes up a little bit, but it's not entirely unique. Uh, the churches remain the same, but get bigger. Uh, there's, there, there's so much evolution rather than abrupt change going on. But the change that we do see, we can see in the modern archaeological record, you know, landscape analysis, the aerial photographs that I showed you, um, uh, the moated sites, the pottery, the key fronts, the ruinous churches, field patterns. We do see change, but it's an evolution rather than an abrupt change. I think the biggest change in Wexford in 1169 was one which is largely invisible to the archaeological landscape. The farmers of the moated sites. Now, not the people who are ploughing for them, but the people who are actually living in the moated sites. Um, and the people who live in New Ross, the traders in New Ross. In the 13th century, if you'd walk through New Ross and indeed Wexford, you might have heard the very end of Hiberna Norse, which is like uh, kind of Old Norse, a bit like Danish. Uh, you, you would certainly have heard Irish. There would have been plenty of English. Loads of Welsh being spoken. Uh, French would be the unifying language and there were Italians and Flemish wandering around these towns. So it's a real, they're very multicultural, polyglot towns. Um, and and you've, you've got an awful lot going on. But the people that came off the boats, I found this, I stole this from the internet. Most of the images are my own. But at Banno 1169, I love the size of the boat. If I'm, going, <laughs> I'm going to invade a foreign country with 500 armed soldiers, I'd get a bigger boat. But anyways, uh, this is the change. It's the people. 
uh, the people who came to Wexford in um, 1169, the 1200s, are not all soldiers. They arrive as soldiers. Traders come, farmers come, wives come, um, uh, potters come, all of those things. But they've got names like Stafford, you know, and, and Roche, The Rock. Devereux, I said Devereux to somebody recently down at Bano and they said, it's Deverix. I said, no, it's the 13th century we're talking about, it's Devereux, it's a French speaker. Anyway, Devereux, Furlongs, Colfers, all of those people. In South Wexford, of course, where probably many of us are from, uh, who's from Forth or Bargy? Bargy. See? <laughs> you can't get things right, can you? Anyways, so Forth and Bargy. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. I was reared in North Wexford, I, so I apologize wholeheartedly. Uh, but those surnames are so common even today. Uh, and the impact of those newcomers is so intense that, of course, as we all know, in the Baronies of Forth and Bargy, uh, the entirely unique dialect or even language of Yola eventually developed in the 13th and 14th century and goes on, survives into the 19th century. That's the change. It's not lifestyles. It's not even archaeology. It's the people and that resentment, perhaps, between the old and the new that simmers for centuries and affects so much of our later uh, and modern history. But archaeology, nonetheless, um, without looking at the history of those names, it can give us an insight into the lifestyles of the people of Wexford. Uh, the material culture study, that, believe it or not, is the beer cellar of the Thomas More Tavern. Uh, I really like this photograph. This is a, a 13th century shoe. See the pointy bit on it? You know those cartoons where the, 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 the guys all have these pointy toes on them? Uh, they're Poulance type shoes and they're real. And there's laws passed that limit how big those can be. It's all about um, conspicuous consumption. So again, like my bungalow being bigger than yours, if my leather shoes are bigger than yours, I've got more money. So, you know, na 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 na. The problem is you trip over yourself. So uh, in times of war, the laws are passed to diminish the size of the leather shoes so you don't fall over yourself in battle. And that just seems to be logical, but nonetheless. It's like the HSA telling us all we have to wear steel toe cap boots. Anyway. Um, so the, the, all of this goes on. That, by the way, is, see that? That's that, uh, dried out and conserved and etc. And this is a little kid's shoe. That's one of my favorite artifacts from Wexford Town. That's a little kid's shoe. That's 13th century, 1200. A really wealthy little kid running around with his fine leather shoes on him. And when they come to the end of the year, they just get chucked out. Look how knackered the adult shoes are. Look, little kid goes out of his shoes and his mammy puts them away and goes, they're Johnny's. Don't touch them now. Uh, and they eventually end up in the muck. So anyway, um, perhaps the biggest change then, apart from the shoes and the wine, and the bigger houses and the bigger stone wall and the bigger port and the bigger ships, perhaps the biggest change for the average resident of medieval Wexford um, was not the material culture, but the organisation of hierarchical society and the, the, the presence of these incomers. Dermot McMurrah died in 1171. And then the traditional kingdom of Leinster came under the control of McMurrah's Anglo-Norman son-in-law, Richard de Clare, also known as Strongbow. Not at the time, though. No one ever said, hey, Strongbow, how are you? He's known as Strongbow historically, which is kind of interesting. Um, so Strongbow was succeeded, of course, by his own son-in-law, William Marshall, who married Isabella de Clare, and who built New Ross uh, and Kilkenny Castle. And, you know, all this mad stuff. So this new generation of Anglo-Norman lords really took control of Wexford, especially South Wexford. Uh, the moths and the ringworts start to be replaced by stone castles. And we can still see them. This is where the archaeology of medieval Wexford stops. Look at that. You can see that. If you, you know when you come over the hill in Camolan, heading south? You can see that. And that would have been rendered and it would have been whitewashed and it would have just stood out in the landscape. And the statement that makes is so intense. Outside of Wexford Town, Robert Fitzstephen's ringwork at Carrick was replaced by a masonry structure sometime in the early 13th century. Dennis is currently playing with it. Uh, that castle, like loads of others, has long since been removed. But some of them do stay. And the Marshall families in Ferns, where interestingly, Dermot McMurrah had a stone house recorded as being burnt in 1166. So he had some sort of a castle there. Uh, it didn't look as good as this one, though. Uh, and then the Prendergast at the Ford of Enniscorthy, that castle, the Prendergast build that, that's still standing as well. And they're the most lasting archaeological features of the medieval period, I think, because everybody can see them. You don't need aerial photographs. You don't need to be an archaeologist. You don't need to dig them up. They're there and they're reminding us of the change of the 13th and 14th century development of Irish culture at that time. So from there, 
to the people who make it all happen. That's all I have to say about medieval Wexford. To be honest, that's all I know about medieval Wexford. <laughs> and I made most of it up. But uh, all of those sites that have been dug, all of those analyses that have been put together, they're all done by these dirty little people who are widely known as archaeologists. And uh, they, I don't know what they're so happy about. They've just dug a five meter wide, two meter deep moated site ditch. And I think they're happy because they're finished. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much for listening. And good night. If anybody has any questions, I will attempt to answer them. If you don't have any questions, that's okay too. Yeah. Uh, you made a reference to clenched nails. Yes. What are clenched nails? They're nails that have a lot of stress. <laughs> that's what they are. They are actually nails clenched to withstand stress. It's funny enough, I went to say that as a joke. Uh, a clenched nail is a nail that you drive through and it's too long and you beat back. We've all done it when we needed a two inch nail, but we only had a four inch nail. <laughs> so you bang, 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 and then dunk, dunk, dunk. Uh, more archaeologically, we refer to them as rivets and roves. So what you do is you get the nail and you bash that through and uh, then you get a rove, uh, which is a washer, square washer but Rove makes it sound like you know what you're talking about. You put that on and then you beat the nail flat against it and then you've got basically a two-headed nail. And the reason you do that is that these early medieval vessels, they're, they're built in such a style that the ribs, the framework that we all know so well from wooden boats, actually not terribly significant. Uh, it's actually the planking that does most of the movement and holds most of the stress. So if you're gonna nail those planks together, you need a head on both sides. So that's what a clenched nail is. Thank you very much for You're a welcome. very interesting talk. Um, just a question and a small comment. Um, the rats, yeah. the, the circular rats, um, I've seen some of them that, well, not, not in County Wexford, where they're entirely, what's, the remains are entirely of stones. Yes. So would they have been, they would have gathered the stones and then piled the clay on top? Yeah, the and it's certain, in, in, washed away. Ish. Either or. Uh, so we call them rats, ring forts in Wexford in the west. We often know them as stone forts or rats. Clare. Uh, Clare, exactly. Yeah. And uh, basically, in the difference between Clare and Wexford, especially West Clare, is there's an awful lot of stones yes. and not a lot of soil. So in Wexford, you can dig up some soil and you can waste it by building a bank. So you use what you have. You use what you have. The other great thing is uh, they, they, we have walls called consumption walls built all throughout Ireland into the 19th and even 20th century. And they're not walls that have tuberculosis. They're walls where you just consume the stones of the field because everywhere you have a stone, grass isn't growing. So if you take that stone up, you want to put it somewhere, you just build a wall. So if you build a stone rath or ring fort or cashel, um, those stones are not stopping the grass from coming up. So that's all. They're exact, culturally, they're exactly the same sites. Yeah. Just the, the comment, uh, I'm from Motorbeg, otherwise known as Salvin. Yes. So uh, I, I don't like when I see Salvin only. And oh. I know in the say Salvin, Salvin. And Motorbeg. Motorbeg, yeah. Um, Did I have Salvin on that? Yeah. Would you believe I had slash Motorbeg earlier and I took it off for some yeah. reason, no uh, knowledge myself? And of course, the, the, um, the structure. Yes. That I remember um, Aidan Ryan, who lives in Browns Wood, that a few years, a good few years ago, he organised for that um, moth to be cleared. But subsequently, of course, nature took over. Mm. When was it cleared? Oh, it could be 30 years ago. So there's 30 years of growth on that. That's actually and very I'm interesting. I'm sure yeah. Aidan, I could ask him yeah. when he organised, because he recognised the importance of it. Yes. And wasn't that Friend of Gas Defence Society mm. before the moved out? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the I'm early sure way in Scorch Castle, in essence. My comment is that, um, I can remember it. Sorry, I can't. Um, oh, yes, that in Pender's so-called census that somebody might be familiar with, 17th century, um, Motorbeg is, is referred to as Mollybeg. Oh, really? So you're, when you're talking about the 16 whatever. Yeah. They don't know how to spell in 16 whatever. It's M O L L I B G. Yeah. Wow, there you go. And, and it has reverted back to Motorbeg now, the small Mot. Mot Motorbeg. Or yeah. Mot and I was born in Motorbeg. So, oh. uh, so I'd like you to use the two. I will. Sal Salville Motorbeg. I've published a Salville Motorbeg. Yes. I have to, I promise, yes. Yes, <laughs> true. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there you go. Salville Motorbeg, outside of the Scorsi. Nine metre high, boated site. Go and spot it if you can. Anybody else? Yes, yeah, sorry, were there a number of families living in the ring fort or was it just one family? One family, but that family would have had underlings, you know, whether they were slaves, whether they were servants, um, but it is the, the, the home of, uh, of a family. Um, you know, 
a landed farmer in essence, but all land really in, pre in, in early medieval Ireland is held kind of in, in co-op within a family or a tribe if you want, but family is a better way of putting it. So ownership per se is not on a deed, but you're talking about a, a, a family farming a piece of land, and often really small piece of land. So you think ring fort, they must be great and big people, 25, 40 acres, and you might have another ring fort three, 400 meters away, half a mile away, depending on the landscape. Um, so they're not, they're not big substantial farms by any imagination. And that's why you think, how could they keep all their cattle inside them? They might only have had 12 or 20 cattle, so you can run them in no problem. Um, so yeah, but they're family holdings, family homes. Curious about when the Stephen and Little Man was in Wexford and it was kind of, you know, what was surrendered and, and you were speaking about the, the lack of a need to displace people of Wexford. But I was just wondering, I mean, it was a wealthy Viking trading town. So oh, yeah. The people there, there was a hierarchy there. Very much so. I mean, so there must have been some reconciliation done or some negotiation or something. Yeah, well. I mean, they didn't just say, oh, that's okay, because they were used to being powerful when. They were trading, and there must have been some tension there. There must have been some kind of yeah. Hence, Fitzstephen goes and builds himself a fortress two miles outside. Yeah, but yes, they, they, we only know historically. I question that. I mean, yeah. Like if he's building it two miles out, because if the town really wanted to get itself together, he was two miles out, and I know he was guarding this lane. But the Vikings, they can come in the sea. They're not Vikings anymore, though. Remember, they're settled trading Highburn and Orson. They've lost that complete madness but incidentally the locals do yeah local well they still get the trade they still get the trade they just pay their taxes to somebody else anyway the locals do uprise and besiege Fitzstephen uh, within a year or so in um, in Carrick and he's taken away in chains and locked up on Begrin Island so you, there's, there's a constant revolt there in the first years of the anglo Norman colony where as long as I have more better armed men than you do you'll say fair enough I'll pay you my taxes but when you get a, an idea that you can actually subvert the new political reality you will attempt but one way or another that those attempts which went on for a long time never built up a critical mass and hence the anglo Norman colony particularly in South County Wexford um, was very successful for a very long time. So in a way was it very successful because it was economically vital enough for people to happen? I think that's, that's a fairly good summary. Yeah. yeah. Like, it, it, you're not going to vote if you're actually well fed and you've got the house and the ground. Yes. And you're used to being, you know, somebody's underling anyway. But also the new people who are in charge of you have, you know, quite a bit of military power. So they, there's a bit of both going on. And, and that being said, it's also archaeologically, historically, it's quite a long time ago, our, our historical sources coming from people like Charlie Wells are incredibly biased. So it's hard to know what people were thinking at the time. Like if there had been an official negotiation, then surely they wouldn't have done it with the bills. So it must have been more based on the military strength and the respect of it. You know what I mean? Because, as you said, they were great for people with words. Yeah, the Anglo-Normans were, but that would be once the colony becomes economically settled, they start to keep manorial accounts and money. Those early years, they were, yeah, they were, they are very much a historical blur. Uh, Geraldus Cambrensis tells us that the Normans assaulted the town once, um, and that uh, the next day a couple of bishops mediated their surrender. But Geraldus Cambrensis can't really be relied on because he also said that a young man named the Barry at the time was hit on the head by a stone. He was an Anglo-Norman, and 15 years later, all of his teeth fell out overnight. But then they grew back again. So, you know, his history is... <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Uh, the shift to tillage, obviously, is yeah. the most significant thing in an agricultural economy. Mm. Uh, and, and it's not sudden. It's not immediate. Yeah. yeah. Well, you say the estimate was that it shifted to 75% of the farm there. In, domain, in domain lands, in lands directly controlled by Cistercian orders and by uh, kind of manorial knights. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's, that might have, I might have mis-explained that not over the island as a whole, but that's just because we have the records. Right. So you, it's hard to tell. Where we have records, they're telling us that 70% of the land is in tillage. Where we don't have records, we don't truly know. Okay. Yeah. The, the, one of the Norman edges, if you will, in, the, um, uh, in military activity was their determination that they would have uh, cavalry in good order at any stage through the 12 months unlike their rivals who tended to only come out in the spring when the horses were in better shape and, and very little cavalry actually used in battle. 
Yeah, so you, you, you're saying basically there's professional soldiers. Really interestingly, at the dissolution of Tintern, which is quite a long time later, obviously, mm -hmm. several centuries later, um, when uh, the land is granted to the Coakleys, uh, one of the conditions of the lease is that, I, you have to forgive me the number now, I think it's six, um, the, the Coakley tenant is obliged, as well as paying his rent, he has to maintain um, six mounted soldiers and uh, four arquebusiers. At any, or no, musket men uh, at any one time. So yeah, his part of his contract of tenancy is that he has to maintain a small body of armed men at any one time because Wexford still at that point is not what you would call utterly culturally and peaceful. That would require grain. Of course, absolutely. Yes, that's good. Oh yeah, yes, I hear you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you have more horses, more mounted men, you need more food, more grain, more beer, more all of the above.